let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Amen. The Lord says, Jacob have I loved. Amen. And Esau have I hated. Amen. And God still hates Esau, we've heard. So that means God still loves Jacob. Amen. And the Bible says, Jacob have I loved. Galatians chapter 1. I want to uh, kind of take a circular route tonight, if I can do that. I'm going to draw a circle, so to speak. Amen. And hopefully, I'm not going to fill it in tonight. In other words, I'm going to make an outline. And hopefully sometime I'll fill it in. But if you've got enough wisdom, you can fill in the circle yourself. And if you've got enough understanding, you can figure out what goes inside. You know, a circle is uh, one of the most pure shapes in all of the creation of God. That is the truth. A circle is one of the most perfect shapes of all of God's creation. It really is. It really is. A circle is, I mean, the earth is basically a circle. The sun, the moon. Amen. They're circles. Amen. And the Bible talks about the circle. Amen. The Bible talks about the wheel in the middle of a wheel. Representing the eternal God himself. Amen. His glorious eternal nature manifesting out in a natural form or in some kind of form. You know, a circle, matter of fact, all electricity, and the key to understanding electricity is based upon the circle. Ain't that right? Amen. He's, he, he, he's not in his head. You get into electronics, it's all based upon a circle. Yes, it is. When you're figuring out all the formulas of reactants and everything, it's based upon pi. The relationship between a circle and the parts of it. I'm telling you, God's mysteries are hidden in the circle now. They are there. There are mysteries of God that are hidden in the circle. Amen. There really are. And I'm not going to get into that, but I'm just going to draw a circle. Amen. amen. If you have the key, amen, to part of the circle, you can figure out what's inside. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calleth you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he says, hey, there's somebody troubling you. And he says, they're perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to go with the Acts chapter 15. Alrighty. He said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from the grace of Christ, you know. I, you know, and it is amazing too how sometimes people are so easily removed from the grace of Jesus Christ. When you look at what Christ has did in your life, hey, I don't care what happens. I don't care what new doctrine people come up with. I don't care all that things. When you just look back at what God did for you, what the grace of Christ has done to you, it's a marvel that we're ever moved away from it. When you think of the experience of salvation that God gave you, it's a marvel. I mean, it's a marvel we would even think about trading that for something else. Or that we would be troubled about anything that anyone else would bring. <laughs> any other gospel, any other mission shouldn't trouble you. Who cares? You know what I'm saying? Amen. It should not trouble you. But he's talking about something being troubled. In Acts chapter number 15. You know, I made a statement the other day about they pervert. They're perversion. It is. There's perversion going on today. Amen. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 23 and 24. He says, and I'm going to read. And talking about this is the first council, so to speak, the church had, all righty? And they had a matter to settle. Because people were being troubled by somebody was trying to subvert their soul. And they were being troubled. And Paul and Barnabas tried to deal with it, but they couldn't get it done. And so the whole matter went back to the elders and the apostles at Jerusalem and the Holy Ghost to see... More than anything, what is the Holy Ghost saying about this song? Amen. And so, verse 23, they figured out what the mind of the Spirit of God was. And then they sent out letters. And, they, and it says this. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. 
For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you. With words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we gave no such commandment. Alright, now let's go back to verse 5. Alright, now what is he talking about there? Verse 5. So they were going out troubling somebody. Subverting their souls now. In verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And that was the question. And I already gave you what the answer was. And believe it or not, that spirit troubled a lot of people in the early church. And believe it or not, that spirit troubles a lot of people today and tries to subvert their souls. Now, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. I want to look at it just a, a little bit. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except... Ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other then should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles... And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And they were come to Jerusalem. They were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So, so, so the question is the law of Moses. Right. Amen. It's not the law of God. It's the law of Moses. Right. That is the question. In this place, circumcision and the law of Moses. Did they need it? Was it a commandment of God? Was the New Testament church commanding to keep that? And their answer flat out emphatically was no. We gave no such commandment as that. Amen. That's why, that's why finally the apostle Paul said, he said, don't even, don't even contend striving the contentions about the law. He said they're unprofitable and vain. Why? Because it's not in effect anyway. So why bicker about it? Right. Amen. If it's in effect, it would be something worth bickering about. Yeah. huh? But if it's not in effect, why even bicker about it? Sure. And that's finally the discrimination he come up to. All right? And then it goes on down. It says, And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us. That the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And so he called the law of Moses a yoke. Yes, he did. He called it a yoke. And it's the same thing the Apostle Paul called it in Galatians. He called it a yoke. And Jesus flat out confronted the Pharisees. He said, you yourselves don't keep the law. None of you do it. That's what Jesus said to him. He confronted him and said, you don't do it. None of you do it. That's exactly what, and it was a yoke. Amen. He said, hey, I believe by the great grace of God they shall be saved. You see, you know, it's interesting when you, when you read the scriptures about grace. You know, the Bible says, if grace is with works, it's no more grace. And if works is with grace, it is no more works. Alrighty. I'm talking about grace. Grace dealing with the election of God. Yes. I'm not talking about what happens after you are elected no. and you begin to walk in grace, then you walk in faith. Right. But I'm talking about grace as God's sovereign choice. Right. 
Brother Stair made a statement the other day that grace always deals with election, and it does. It always. See, and, and that's why you can't add anything to that election process of God. That process you can't add to it. It's just God's choice. It's the potter's choice. He ordains and that's it. You see, and I like it how the apostle, uh, John said when he talked about Jesus. He said, and of his fullness all we have received. And listen, what's the next phrase? And grace for what? Grace. For grace. You see, his, he looked at it and all of a sudden there was nothing he could say about grace. But he said, grace for grace. No, he couldn't add nothing to it. Couldn't do nothing about it. That grace stood with grace itself. That doesn't mean it doesn't produce faith. That doesn't mean after you've received it, it doesn't move you in a way. But I'm just saying, grace for grace. Grace for grace. That's a profound statement. Amen. Grace for grace. It doesn't need anything else to operate in itself. Now, what I'm saying is way back in the beginning, when God, there was grace. He established it right there. Before you were around, before I was around. Amen. Before, before the world was around. Amen. The Bible talks about Jesus Christ being crucified from the foundation. That, that was grace. You see, and back then there wasn't no world. There wasn't no you. There wasn't no me. There was nothing. But there was still grace. And that grace stood from the foundation of the world. And our names are written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. And that's, all, that's why I'm saying that elective process of grace. Because there's those that pervert it, they turn God's grace into lasciviousness today. Matter of fact, that's why God's finally going to close out grace. Just like they turned the law of God into a filthy thing. They did. If you'll study what, what, what the scribes and Pharisees and all of them were doing with the law of God, the law of Moses, they had turned it into a filthy thing. They were living filthy, filthy, filthy lives. He said, you're within full of all manner of wickedness and hypocrisy and evil. And yet they're saying, hey, we're doing the law of God. We're doing the law of Moses. Yes, they were. And finally God just wiped it out. See, and today, at the end of the church, age, what they're doing? It's the grace that is, is being turned into a lasciviousness. And it's being turned into a lustful situation. And those grace is being portrayed as lust, unbridled lust that's permissible. My God. And it's just not. But God's grace is... Is, is a tremendous thing. Ephesians chapter, notice he says in verse 9, and put no difference between them and us. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. You see, the law of Moses had put a difference. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the differences tonight, all righty, but I'm telling you, the law of Moses made a difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The Amorites couldn't enter into the congregation. For, no uncircumcised, no stranger could come into the temple of God. No way. I mean, there was put a difference. Yeah. Amen. There was made a difference. Amen. He says, hey, this thing here, this gospel of grace now, he said there is no difference. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says, and right before this now, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Right before this, he's talking about not of works, but by grace are you saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10, he said, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk. See, there's that foundation. God already ordained them. That's God's grace. They were ordained beforehand for the foundation of the world. And all we do is we just learn of that which God has foreordained. And we just submit ourselves to the righteousness of God. And we don't go about to establish our own righteousness, but we submit. In other words, He has a righteous plan. In other words, he has foreordained certain good works. And as we let the Spirit of God lead and guide us, we will perform those works that were foreordained. But it's just a matter of submitting to the grace of God and letting it work out His divine influence and purpose in our lives. Amen. But it's already before ordained. Grace deals with election. It's the strength of grace. It really is. It's there. And so then, wherefore, now listen to this, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, this that scripture, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, 
that at that time, what time? The time past. I was talking about a time past. A previous time than when the Apostle Paul was writing this book of Ephesians. He said that at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now listen to me. He says, wherefore remember that ye in time past were strangers. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of pride, having no hope and without God in the world. Why? Because in the time past, the promises, the covenants, all of that was given to Israel. It was given to Israel. Jesus was not lying when he said, Ye worship to the woman of Samaria. He said, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. At that time when Jesus spoke, amen, their salvation was still of the Jews. They were still the people of the covenant. They still had the covenants of promise. They were the commonwealth of Israel. And at that time they had hope and they had God in their midst. They, they did. They had Christ in their midst. They had the anointing in their midst. The Bible said that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God had committed his oracles to his people. Now, I'm going to go on down, if you will, with me to Matthew chapter 21. You know, Isaiah gave a parable in Isaiah chapter 5. Tremendous parable. Matter of fact, they about butchered Jesus when he, when he brought it out. They, about, they sought to kill him when he brought out this parable of Isaiah. And Isaiah said, hey, the Lord planted a vineyard. And he planted vines and he hedged it about and he made the wine press and he did all those. This is Isaiah 5. He did all those things. All righty. And then he said, uh, and then he, then he said, in Isaiah he says this, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. I want you to remember that. Alright, Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew, so who is the vineyard? The house of Israel. Matthew chapter number 21. And what does Jesus say? He gives them a parable of the Vineyard, and they catered him for it. Matthew 21, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. That was Israel. They were the ones that God planted, God established. They were, they, they were the kingdom of God. Amen. They were the kingdom of God. They had the covenants, the promise, the presence, yes. the authority on the faith, the oracles of God. They were God's kingdom. Yes. You know, the Lord said this. Stay right there. Now, therefore, if ye will obey. In Exodus, he went back and said, Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. And there's you're going to be a kingdom. Yes. You're going to be the kingdom of God. Right. There's the authority of God going to rest with you at that time. You know, the Bible says in Chronicles, The Lord hath chosen, David speaking, The Lord hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And so there again Solomon is said to rule over the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Why? Because Israel at that time was the kingdom of God. They were the chosen. They were the nation God has chosen. In Matthew 21, back to that. In verse 35 says, And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. 
But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, and let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And then it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever shall fall, it shall grind him to power. He said, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and shall be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. First Peter chapter 2. And so Jesus right there prophesied. He said, You are the kingdom of God right now. You have the kingdom of God, Israel. He said, But, but, but you are going to reject the Son. And when you reject that Son... Amen. Then that kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another nation, to another one, another people. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Well, right, because I, I want you to understand that, that God took his kingdom away from Israel for a purpose and for a time. And for a time, too. God, remember, God works on time. Amen. God works on time. Therefore, remembering the time and the season. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. I need to read a few scriptures. Verse 5 says, talking about, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That's the scripture Jesus used. Matthew 21. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble, listen to this, at the word being disobedient, where unto also they were, is that scripture now, appointed. In other words, God foreordained that they would even stumble at the word. And that they would stumble over that, and that was ordained, it wasn't happenstance. No, God ordained that when Jesus come, that Israel was going to stumble over that stone. And then again, it was for a purpose. It was for a purpose. Amen. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar... That, that's the nation he was talking about. When he said the kingdom of God shall be taken away from and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits... That, that's what he's talking about, right? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the church, the body of Christ, the church, the spiritual people. Amen. The nation of God. The church is God's nation today. It is God's people. And he goes on down and says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible talks about clearly, He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And so right now we are in the kingdom of God. Amen. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy in the Holy Ghost. So that's God's kingdom. That's that spiritual temple that's offered of spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Then he goes on. Verse 10, which in time past were not... Uh, people, remember? There's that place in time past 
Talking about at that time, the time passed, you were strangers and aliens. But now, ah, but now, the story's changed now. Now the Gentiles that have received Christ, the church is the body of Christ, the nation of God. The church has and is the kingdom of God. That is God's kingdom. As far as the place where God's covenant is, the place where God's word is, the place where God's promise is, the place where God's anointing is, where the place where God's life is, is in the church. And he took it away from Israel. And it's not there in Israel. And it hasn't been in Israel since the day that Jesus was crucified. It's not been there. That's why we're... Now we'll get into something. But, said, but verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So now we have obtained the mercy of God. Now we are a nation. Now we are a preacher. Now we are the people of God. Behold what manner of love. Jacob have I love. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon that we should be called the sons of God. And so now are we the sons of God. Luke chapter number 13. Luke chapter number 13. Amen. You see, when Jesus was crucified, the Bible says he cried with a loud, cried with a loud voice. And gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain. From the top to the bottom. Almighty God stretched forth his hand. And said, this is it. This covenant is ended. Amen. This thing is finished. And when we talk about finished, he was talking about that covenant. That covenant is finished. It's through. Amen. Amen. That, that was finished. Amen. Amen. The Bible talks about with the death of a testator mm -hmm. came in a new covenant. Yes. And that testator was Jesus Christ. He was the witness. He was the testator. He was the author. And he is the finisher. Thank God he's going to finish it too. And Luke chapter 11 says, we are come unto Mount Zion. Luke chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 13. I, I really want to go back. First, let me go to Zechariah. You just stay in Luke chapter 13. I want to read a scripture out of Zechariah. All these things are in God's Word. Amen. Zechariah chapter 11. Now, I know I'm going to get into some things a little bit that some of you may not have heard, may have heard, may not believe, may not believe. Oh, you know, and uh, you may not like the scenario presented, but that's whatever. Amen. Just remember the foundation of the gospel. That if, you can forg if you don't believe and buy what I say, just remember there is a new covenant. There is a foundation. Amen. God has brought us as his people. All righty. That's the main thing. Why? Because even if you had nothing else, if you could hold on to that. Amen. If you could hold on to that, it, it will keep you. Amen. It, is, it will keep you. Zechariah chapter number, and I want to read this. Just hang on. I want to read this. Zechariah 11. I'm going to read this. Verse 10 through 13 says this. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder. That I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And you know what's right after that? And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Do you understand what he said? He prophesied, I said, I'm going to break my covenant. I'm going to cut it asunder. And he said, he told him exactly when he's going to break his covenant. And it was prophesied. He said, when they weigh my price, my 30 pieces of silver, at that time I'm going to break my covenant with them. Why? Because my covenant is, I will be your God. You'll be my people. I'll make you a holy nation, a royal priesthood. 
I will exalt you above all the people of the earth, but I'll be your God. And when Jesus come unto his own, and his own received him not, when they rejected Christ, they rejected the covenant of God. That God, they rejected their God. And God said, if that's all you wait 30 pieces of silver, then my covenant is broken. It prophesied. He told exactly when he was going to break it. And he broke it. When Jesus was crucified, he broke that covenant. They rejected their God. He rejected his people. He took the kingdom away from them. Amen. And, and it's very interesting. Luke chapter number 13. Luke 13. Verse 31 through 35. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Now remember, at that time, who had the kingdom of God? It was Israel. And all the prophets of God were sent to Israel. Why? Because they were God's people. Right. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. And Jerusalem prayed for the blood of all the prophets up to that time when it was made desolate. And Jesus made that clear. See. Now, when we're in the church age, the church is God's kingdom. The church is God's nation. And today God sends his prophets to the church. Right. As far as at this time, that's where they are. They all don't got to be killed in Jerusalem, people. Come on, throughout the last 2,000 years, there have been prophets in the church that have been killed in probably every, almost every land of the world. He was talking at the time when Israel was the kingdom of God. They were the people of God, and God sent his prophets to his people. And like today, he sends his prophets to the church. Yes, he does. Why? Because everything... And I'll get into them. Everything that was given as the promises of God to Israel, the presence of God, the anointing, the authority, has been given to the church as God's kingdom and as God. Verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather a brood under her wings? And ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Amen. In other words, Jesus was saying, your house is going to be left unto you desolate. Amen. Which means empty, waste, whatever. Empty. Right. Lifeless. <clears throat> Without life. Amen. You know, it's got that connotation. Of being lifeless, sort of, desolate, waste. Uh, what's that terminology used? I'm trying to think of that word you used, Brother Stan. What's that word you used for desolate so many times? Void. Void. That's it. Void. In other words, it actually can still be a place there, but it's void. Right. It's empty. In other words, like a lifeless. It's just like a carcass without life in it. Amen. In, in other words, he said, you're going to be left desolate. And when Jesus died on Calvary, and that veil of the temple was rent in twain. Listen, be careful. From that moment on, you never, ever saw the spirit of prophecy in the nation of Israel itself. That spirit translated to the church. And it has been, and from that time till this day, Israel has not had the spirit of prophecy, has not had the guidance of God, has not had the direction of the Almighty God. They have even been, spiritually, a desolate nation. Now, there's other desolation he's talking about too but I'm just want to, I want to zero in on the kingdom of God as, which is righteous, righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost God took it away from them he said the kingdom will be taken away from you and it's been gone that's why if anybody looks into natural Israel today for some kind of wisdom for some kind of understanding for some kind of ritual some kind, some kind of depth of knowledge and understanding they're looking in the wrong place they need to look in the church they need to look to Jesus Christ they need to look 
to that which God has given in the church, He gave the ministry, He gave the word, He gave the promise. He gave the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You know, it's amazing. You know what the last great prophecy Israel had? One of the last great ones they had, or probably the last prophecy that was part of the covenant. It was the high priest. You remember that? It's amazing. <laughs> that high priest prophesied. I'm going to read it. That high priest prophesied something, people. I'm going to read what he prophesied. And then, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself. Now he just wasn't speaking this. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Do you understand when Israel had the covenant, the, the spirit of prophecy was on the high priest. Amen. Hey, come on, when the children went out to battle, they would go up unto the priest, man, and they had the Urim, and they had the Thummim, and God would speak to them, and God would answer them. Remember, every time David went out to battle, he went up and inquired. He inquired of the Lord, up in the priest. Why? Because, why? because that's where God's spirit was well. Yeah. Amen. The spirit of prophecy was in the midst of Israel. I mean, if you look from the beginning, see, that's why the birthright was so important. Because that's what the birthright was. Even before the nation of Israel, when God chose Abraham, the birthright was God's presence, was God's spirit dwelling in the midst of it, was the kingdom of God being established. In other words, he would be their God. He would answer them. He would reveal them to things. He would show them. And then that transferred to the nation of Israel. And then finally God stopped it. Amen. When Jesus died, God stopped it. They rejected their God. He rejected them. He gave the kingdom to another nation, which is his church. And today the church has the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that is in the church. Amen. And all the power and the covenant and the glory of God is in the church. I want to stress it. Why? Romans chapter 11. Why? Because Israel, as God's kingdom, died. As God's nation, died. As God's people, died. Amen. Died. They become dead. They become desolate. They become lifeless. So lifeless. Now li listen to me. For a time. For a purpose. So lifeless that there is no life in them today. There is no spiritual life. There's nothing. I'm telling you the truth. If you look for any spiritual understanding, it's just like these people. That, 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 that's why they're, so, they're perverts. That's what they're, they're perverted. These people talk about all that law of Moses. I'm talking about the law of Moses. Not the law, the law of Moses. Not the law of God. I'm talking about the law of Moses. And they go into all that stuff. And they go over to Jerusalem. And they talk to all the rabbis. And they get all the wisdom and the knowledge of the rabbis and all these things. And they're into all that kind of stuff. They have turned away from the grace of Jesus. They've turned away from the spirit of the living God that dwells in the midst of his people. And they went to a nation that has no spiritual life to find life. And they'll find nothing but perversion. They'll find nothing but disillusion. They'll find nothing but deceit. Because there is no life there. Since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And until such a time as be ordained. Of Almighty God. Because God is going to raise him from the dead people. Matter of fact, I am amazed. I am amazed at how many prophecies in the Word of God describe that God is going to raise up again the nation of Israel. Now, I want to, Romans chapter 11, but I want to read the scripture. You know, we know about Ezekiel chapter 36. Chapter 37, the dry bones. Isn't that something? The dry bones. 
You know, and if you look in Ezekiel chapter 36, God prophesied. He said, I'm going to bring my people from all the nations where they've been scattered. And he talks about, I'm going I'm to do a change in them. Amen. But it's very interesting. He says to Ezekiel, I want you to see what they look like now. I want you to see what they look like. And he says, For I w-, he says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. And that was true. And that is true to this day. And that, no, no, I'm telling you, God showed him. God showed him in prophecy. God showed him, and you can read it, you can read it. God showed him in prophecy that they were very dry bones with no life. Right. Zero. And in other words, the kingdom of God had been taken away from them. And so those eagles looking back and seeing what can happen. And then God, and God shows him that he is going, it's prophesied, he is going to restore. He's actually going to restore. He's going to restore that nation. You know, when I tell people David is going to be raised up from the dead and he's going to be king over Israel, People look at me strange. It's, it's prophesied in three or four places in the Bible, people. Not just once. Three or four that he is actually going to raise up David and is going to set him as the king over Israel. And he means exactly what he says. David is going to be raised from the grave and become, come again the king over Israel. He's going to do it. It's written in God's word. Now, Romans chapter 11. See, it was such a lifeless. There's nothing there. There is, I'm, t- I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. There's just nothing there. Romans 11, verse 12. But we have to be careful. Because he talks about, Paul says, Has God cast his way as people which he foreknew? I'm going to start with verse 1. I say then, have God cast away his people? God forbid. Hang on a minute. Has God, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Israel now. He's talking about the nation. He's talking about that nation there. He said, Has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Israel. He's, he's talking about that natural seed. He said, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. And yet, then further on down, he talks about them being cast away. What's he saying? You know, God, God has put them aside, Amen. they are dead. They've been cut off. There is no life in them. But don't forget one thing. God is the God of the resurrection. God is able to raise from the dead. And that's why Paul, Paul, Paul makes it clear. He said, they're dead now. They have no life now. He said, but you better be careful. Why? You better be careful in what you think of why God cut them off. And you better be careful what you think about how God is going to bring them back. And you better not be wise in your own conceit. And there's a reason for that. Because a lot of people say, cause, cause I'll, I'll tell you what, God still loves Jacob. God still loves Jacob. Amen. He does. He still loves, he, his heart, you, you're going to, in a short time, we're going to see the yearning of God's heart for Jacob again. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm actually talking about Israel. God loves his people. We're God's king. He loves, but there is something, God made a promise to Abraham. Amen. There's a yearning in the heart of God for his people. God still loves Jacob. Jacob is Israel people. If you don't understand who Jacob is, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob is Israel. And God still loves them. He's just cast them off for a while. But Paul said, don't get in your head that he doesn't know them anymore. He just cast them off. They're away for a while. And he makes that clear. I'm going to go on down. I'm going down. Verse 12. Now if... Verse 11. I say then, he talks about how they're going to be darkness and they're going to be blind. And then he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. He said, they're not going to fall. But then he says, <laughs> but rather through their fall. But then he says, they fall. But he says, they're not going to fall. He says, but they fail. Does anybody read that like I read it? It sounds pretty contradictory to, to the natural man. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall. There he says, hey, this thing is not a forever type of thing, people. They are fallen. They've stumbled that they should fall. But don't think they're fallen. They're completely out of this thing. As far as the foreknowledge of God and the foreordination of God is concerned. Yes, at the time, they're on the mat. Amen. And they're going to be down for the count of nine. But before the ten count comes, you better remember God is still the God 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He revealed himself as the, and he still is. God is still today the God. Uh, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am. Amen. And the I am is still the I am of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's why all the perversion that's why all the perversion where they talk about the different nations being Israel and America being Israel and all that they pervert the word of God. They make it hard for God to people to understand what's happening. Amen. God's people is the church and the body of Jesus Christ as far as that spiritual house. But God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He still is watching down in his prophetic realm and time clock. He still has ordained that he's going to raise them from the dead. And he's going to reestablish them in that land. And they're going to be a praise and a glory. And the power and the majesty of God is going to be seen again on them. And God makes it clear. I want to show it in the scriptures. But before... The majesty of God is going to be seen again on them. And God makes it clear. I want to show it in the scriptures. But before that happens, they're going to suffer too. Amen. Amen. And he goes on down, verse 7. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, thank God it was, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their, what? Fullness. What, what do you mean? He said, in other words, when the fullness of God comes back to them. Oh, how much more? It's going to be a glorious event. For I speak to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be? But what? But what? But what? Life? And in other words, he's saying they're dead now. Amen. They're dead now. They're dead. But of the Gentiles, how much more their what? Fullness. What, what do you mean? He said, in other words, when the fullness of God comes back to them. Oh, how much more? It's going to be a glorious event. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be? But what? Life the but what? Life the but what? Life? And in other words, he's saying they're dead now. Amen. They're dead now. They're dead. But they're going to be received again and it's going to be what? It's going to be life from the dead. It's going to be a raising up of dead, a dead nation without life. God's going to resurrect it. Amen. See, Apostle Paul saw all this. He said, I know mysteries that were hidden from the foundation of the world. Yes, yes that's what he said. He said, I've been given this dispensation. And then what he's saying, I see it from beginning to end. He saw the dispensation Amen. of the grace of God. He saw how it was going to begin, and he saw how it was going to end. And he knew a few things before and after it too. He saw it. And then he goes on down. For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if the sum of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree are grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. And I believe Jesus is the olive tree. <laughs> I believe he is the olive tree. And I believe the root is the eternal God, the invisible God. And I believe the trunk is that image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ. And now we partake of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree and Israel as a branch has been cut off but he said now boast not against the branches 
But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, he says, well now, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed also, lest he spare not thee. And then he says, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on thee, them which fell severity. But toward thee goodness, if thou continue his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And then he goes on down, verse 25. Listen to this carefully now. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until, until, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, that is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies Amen. for your sakes. And they are. There ain't, there ain't a person that's more an enemy of the gospel than the Jews. They are an enemy of the gospel. They hate the gospel. Amen. They forbid the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life. They are an enemy of the gospel. But don't forget, they're an enemy for your sake. But as touching the election, now listen to this careful, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Do you believe that? Apostle Paul saying the Father still loves them, so be careful. Why? Because God still hates Esau. And God still loves Jacob for the election's sake. But they are enemies for the gospel's sake. But you have to be careful. Why? Because you've got to have the right heart, the right spirit, the right mind concerning what is God doing with His people. Zechariah chapter 4. And I'm, going to get into, I'm not going to get into a lot of the scriptures. Because I, I, I don't want to do You know, but there's an overwhelming amount of scriptures that talk about the restoration of Israel to their land. It's almost unbelievable. The, the Bible talks about the restitution of all... You know what he's talking about there? The restitution of all things? You, you know the final part of that... And I, I could go scripture after scripture. I'm not going to do it tonight because it's not the subject. The final part of the restitution of all, all things is the rest, restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Right. See, there's going to be a restoration of all things to the church. Right. Everything to the church is going to be restored. Amen. And, but but then, then when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, then it's still not done yet. And I'm talking about God's time clock. It's done for the Gentiles. But then God is going to restore again the kingdom to Israel. Right. He's going to do it. Right. Amen. And there's going to be a restitution of all things. And until that final restitution of the church, and then that final restitution of the kingdom of Israel, Jesus can't come. Amen. That's right. He can't. See, and, and that's where a lot of them miss it. Because they forget that there is that time of restitution also to Israel. And Jesus is not going to come before that time. That's why he's not going to come until after the tribulation. Until after the tribulation. Why? Because actually in the tribulation, during the tribulation, and at the end of the tribulation, is when God is going to restore Israel. At the very end of it, they'll finally be restored. It'll be right at his coming. But listen to me carefully. There is going to be a restoration even before the coming of Jesus Christ. Hear me out. I want to get to some scriptures. Remember, the time of the Gentiles is going to end. When the fullness of Gentiles come in. And he said then. He said until that time. They're blind. You see, but hey. Once the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Something's going to happen people. In Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel that talked with me. Remember Jesus is what? He's the olive tree. Yeah he is. Hey where do you think your oil comes from? Jesus said I have received the promise of the Father. Which I'm going to pour out on you. And that's the fatness of the olive tree. That's that set. And if you're a branch, you've been grafted into that olive tree. Amen. You drink of that life. Amen. He that is a thirst, let him come and drink of the water of life free. Amen. You drink of that life, that spirit. You, you know, we just need to drink of God's spirit. 
Hey, you better take a good gulp while you still can get a drink. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's what I'm going to say. Amen. You better remember. You better savor it. Amen. You better taste and see the Lord is good. Amen. Why? Just that drink. You better remember it. Amen. You remember how good it is and how good it was and how good it shall be again. Because he was he that liveth and was dead and behold, he is now alive forevermore. And we live and we're going to die, but we're going to be alive again. Just like him. Just like Israel. You remember, God is the God of the resurrection. You know, I, we, we just don't teach the resurrection much. Hey, I, I remember the resurrection was a profound part of, of teaching in, in the church where I was. It was. It was just there. It was just there. It, it was a foundation. I'm telling you, you just don't hear much about the resurrection of the dead anymore. It's not preached out in the church as much anymore. It just is not. And it's, a profi- it's one of the basic doctrines of Jesus Christ. Resurrection of the dead. Sure. Yes, it is. It's one of the basic doctrines of Christ. This is Zechariah 4. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I've looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which were on the top of it and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, do you get the picture? There's two branches of an olive tree, one on each side. There is a candlestick that's got seven kind of bowls on it. Alrighty, now go on down. Verse 7. Verse 6, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, these two olive trees represent how the spirit of God comes into the candlesticks. I'll get to that in a second. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain? And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. And I always think that one there, part of it's a prophecy of, of John the Baptist coming. Why? Because he shouted, Grace, grace. Why? He, he said, he's the one who said, And of his fullness all we have received, and grace for grace. And who laid that headstone? Come on, so to speak, he laid that headstone. He put it out there. He put that headstone. Now, I don't want to get into something. Verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and I don't understand there was a Zerubbabel at this time. And I understand that they were building the temple at that time. I know that. Amen. And we understand that. But also, too, there are prophetic scriptures. Amen. It's just like, it's just like the scripture in Ezekiel, the dead bones. That there, there was a, he was actually talking there about the natural, but yet he's talking also about the people of God. I mean, there's a lot of scriptures. Just like he said, I will call my son out of Egypt. That was talking about the Egypt, when them come out of Egypt. And then again, that was applied to Jesus Christ. And so there is the application. I'm just saying. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And I'm not going to deal with that. Verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said unto me, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. And we know who stood by the Lord of the whole earth when he was transfigured Amen. on the mountaintop. There were two anointed ones that stood by the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. And that's who they are. And they represent the apostles and the prophets. 
in their manifestation. They were both prophets. Moses was a prophet. Elijah was a prophet. But Moses was more than a prophet. All right. In other words, Moses was a lawgiver. The Bible calls him a lawgiver. Well, and, and, and I want to make this distinction. In other words, here is the two olive trees or olive branches. You can look it up. All right. Where do they get their oil from? From the trunk, from the root. All right. And then they pour it out of themselves. And at this time, they're pouring it into the seven golden candlesticks. At that time, which is Israel. Now listen, be careful. In, 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 in other words, the foundation of every covenant is the apostles and the prophets. That is the foundation. That is how God reveals, how God brings, and how God confirms a new covenant or a different covenant than the existing one. And that's why Moses was a lawgiver. If he was in the New Testament, we would have called him an apostle. Right. Why? Because he was one that was sent to establish right. basic covenant Doctrine, and, that, and, and that's what the difference is. An apostle is the only one that can establish covenant doctrine. Right. Having received them by revelation, establishes a new covenant. Amen. And the old covenant is out of the way. And the previous covenant is out of the way. And the prophets, they confirm it. They build on it. They bring the revelation of it greater. And that's the way it is. And these represent. And every time God establishes a covenant... With his people, you'll see those two. Always. They're always there. But if I want to read a scripture, turn with me to, I want to read. read I'm going to read it. You turn with me to uh, Revelations 11. I'm just going to read a scripture. You turn to Revelation 11. I want to read a scripture. And you all know this one. Paul talks about, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or how that... Mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And then he says, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So he says when God wants to reveal his mysteries, his secrets, he reveals the things that are hidden from the foundation of the world through the apostles and the prophets. Why? Because when you're dealing with a covenant, it can't be just prophets. Why? Because they are not ordained to establish covenant doctrine. They're given to prepare for it. They're given to confirm it. They're given a revelation of when it's going to come. They bring the people back to the covenant of God. Always. They do it. And the apostles established. That's what the Bible talks about. It doesn't say that we... It talks about that we go in the apostles' doctrine. Why they established the doctrine of the church. It was written by apostles. They established it. They had the revelation of it. Amen. And the prophets of God confirmed it. Amen. The prophets of God prepared the way. And the prophets bore witness to it. Hey, you know, you know, Jesus wasn't an apostle, all right? Amen. The Bible says he was an apostle, okay? And, and, and who witnessed of John witnessed of right. Jesus Christ. Right. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of that light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And he bore witness of Jesus and his coming. You know, he was just there. And, and if you look, you, you know, the Lord said of in Luke chapter 1, it's the prophecy that come to Zechariah. Talking about John, it says, And he shall go before him, in, now listen to me carefully, in the spirit and the power of Elias. Why? There's that prophetic part of those two olive trees. And John began to empty out the oil. He began to empty out his oil. And then here comes Jesus Christ. And he began to empty out his oil Alrighty. into the candle sticks. My friend, let me read something. Script. Listen to the scripture. And Judas, you, you know what happened when they had that discussion in Jerusalem? 
and they sent the letters to everybody. Do you know what else happened? you know who went out with those letters? I want to read something. Listen. And Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They took the letters, that, that doctrine that was given from the apostles and the elders and the brethren in Jerusalem. Do, do you hear what he said? Now there's, there was two prophets named Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them and confirmed what? and confirmed the decrees the apostles doctrine in, in, other, in other every time yeah that's right that's how God uses it he used apostles and he used prophets to bring forth the doctrine to confirm it to prepare for it or whatever however you want to say it I'm just saying that's the way that God uses and then was the two olive trees Amen. That, that's what they represent. And they are the two, and they are literally two anointed ones. Amen. But, there, but that spirit right. of the true olive trees works in the apostles and Amen. the prophets. So that's why after the, after the apostles established the basic doctrine of the covenant, at that time there was no more need. Matter of fact, if you look in the Old Testament, there never was another Moses. No. There was no need. Why? Because Moses did his job. Right. Amen. He established all the doctrine of the Old Covenant. That's exactly right. right. And all, all the prophets after him, all of them did it. They cried out to God's people. They prophesied of things that were coming. They prophesied of judgment. But, 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 but the whole reason for it all was try to bring people back to the covenant of God. Try to bring them back to where they had fallen away from. Amen. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly right. And in the church, God men are trying to bring people back to Jesus Christ. Trying to bring them back to the holiness of Christ. Trying to bring them back to the righteousness of God. Trying to bring them back to the truth of Jesus. That's exactly right. Trying to bring them back to a life of holiness, of righteousness, a life of the Spirit, a life of purity. That's the truth. And that's what they're doing. Amen. And now, I want to read a scripture, alrighty? I'm getting down there to Revelation. Just bear with me. See, the Bible says, To the law... And to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, that was written in the book of Isaiah, chapter 8. And that is the truth. When that thing was written at that time, the revelation of the old covenant, the law of Moses, and the testimony which God gave, that was what all of the prophets brought the people back to. That's the truth. They did. And he said, to the law of testimony, and if they speak not according to this word, it is because... There is no light in them. Somebody said, well, that's what it is today. No, it's not. That's not what it is today. Huh? That is not what it is today. There is a new covenant today. And I want to read some scripture. There is a new covenant today. Amen. And the Spirit of God, which testifies, it says this, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. In this covenant, it is to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. And if they do not testify of this, there is no life in them. That's the truth. He said, you're going to know. He said, many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And if they are every prophet that's true is going to testify that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That He is God's Lamb. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And they do. Everyone. He says, He shall not speak of Himself. Jesus said, He shall glorify me. Now the Holy Ghost is always going to lead to Jesus Christ. He's going to reprove you of your sins. He's going to rebuke you. He's going to chip. But why? Why? The whole purpose is to bring you back to Christ. To righteousness and holiness. That's the purpose. And the Bible says to Him. To whom? To Jesus. To Him. Give all the prophets witness. That through His name. Whosoever believeth in Him shall receive the remission of sins. And he said, hey. Apostle Paul, they said, well, I want to tell you something about this man to whom is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin and you can be justified from all things by which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Through this man you can be justified from them. And that's in Acts. He talks about that. I just want to say, that's what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. But though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel. 
What was he talking about? He's talking about you've been called into the grace of Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're all their witness of that. Now, remember in the Old Testament, the two poured forth their oil into the seven golden candlesticks. That's right. Now, it's very interesting in, in Revelations. In Revelations. Amen. And, and God, you know, the Bible talks about built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But it's very interesting in the book of Revelation, where you see Jesus, Revelation chapter 1, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. He walked in the midst of them. In other words, it was showing a very intimacy. And in, in listen to me. When, when, when the covenants are established, amen, God uses apostle, prophet. And when he's speaking to his church, God uses apostles and prophets. When he's revealing things to his church, God uses apostles and prophets. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's, these are things that are associated with the church, with the worldwide church, with the issue of the church. But listen to me very carefully. In the New Testament, is it's not even near like the Old Testament. Why? Because in the New Testament, still Jesus walking right in the midst. Right. You know, he still used that spirit of revelation right. through the ministry there, but also too, he's right there in the midst. Oh. There is one mediator yeah. between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that's where so many believers miss it. God will help you. God will show you what you need in your individual life. miss it. God will help you. God will show you what you need in your individual life. Not things that pertain maybe to the church as a whole, but to your daily that God will help you. You know, I've, I've, I've found that all over the... You know, he not, if, you, if you're not called to the ministry, He's not going to reveal some great truth about the church that is given to be the church. No, 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 don't worry about it. But He will show you in your daily walk, in your daily life. He'll be right there. He will help you. He'll touch you. He'll strengthen you. He'll reveal what you may need to know, even in your little work. You're not sure how to do it. God will actually help you. You can pray in the Lord. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. I mean, as far as what your place is, God will do everything He can to establish and bless you in that place. He's right there in the midst. He walks around. He listens. He says, I will dwell in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I will dwell right in the midst of them. See, I, I've seen that all over the world. I've watched. God will speak to His people. He, those that have sense enough to listen. He'll do it. He that hath an ear, let him hear. But the thing is, he's going to show you what you need to know for what you're doing. For what you're doing. Not what everybody else is doing, for what you're doing. Amen. That's what we're doing. That's what we've got to be careful. Revelation chapter 11. I want a few more scriptures. I'm on. Revelation chapter 11. I don't want to. I'm on. So there's two anointed ones. Ah, yes. They're going to pour out their oil again. Hmm? Yes, they are. And there was given unto me, and there was given me a reed, like unto a rod. Ah, sounds like Zechariah, huh? He gave somebody a reed, didn't he? Given unto me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise. And measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, like I said now, if you believe differently, I'm not worried about it. Alrighty. You know, in the aspect of just believe what you believe. Alrighty. Remember the foundation of God is sure. I'm just going to throw something out as far as a scenario. I'm, I'm going to go back to, to the thing I know is should prepare to die. Okay, I do know that. Prepare to die. I do know that. I do know that we are as sheep counted for the slaughter. That's, that's the promise God has given to us. Amen. That's exactly right. And I, and I do know that. All righty? Amen. And however different ones suffer it or whatever or wherever, I can't say. 
But I am going to say that the Bible does talk about that they will kill you. Okay? Amen. And that is written in God's Word. Now how it's going to happen, where and how and why, and the different specifics, that's up to Almighty God. Amen. Then he says, But the court which is without the temple leave out, verse 2, And measure not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now he's prophesying about the end. He's prophesying when God's going to turn back to Israel for a period of time. See, after the fullness of the Gentiles come in, that, that's why the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because, because God is going to zero in on Jacob. Now the church is going to be going through their own thing, but God is going to zero in on Jacob. See, when that, when that, and listen, when that get fullness of the Gentile come in, God is going to take His Spirit out of the church. All right? And then He's going to deal once again for a short period of time with Israel. Amen. Yes, He is. He's right. going to deal with them. Now, I'm not going to get into all the Scriptures on that tonight. I just want to lay a few things out and stop. But He says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. You see, there's going to be a temple built again. Right. Amen. Amen. And... The court and the city is going to be trod another the Gentile. Right. Alrighty. But somewhere God is not going to be permitted that temple to be trod. Amen. For a period of time. He, he said, but without, he says that, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentile. In other words, that which is within inside, somehow God is going to preserve it for a period of time. For a purpose. Amen. All right. For a purpose. Alrighty. Now I'm not going to get into what leads up to it. <laughs> but just hear me for a second. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, three and a half years, forty and two months, clothes and sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. All right, the two olive trees. I believe they're the two anointed ones. You know. Okay. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Do you understand that? When the Bible talks about he's going to have power over all the kindred, nation, and tribe, and he shall overcome the saints. You understand what he's saying? He's saying he'll have power to kill people. All right. But the Bible tells us, hey, man, so what? They kill the body? Amen. Fear not him that kills the body, that cannot destroy the soul. See, really, if we just believe God's scripture, it will comfort our hearts. There's a tremendous comfort if you just believe what God... You don't have to understand it. Oh, just believe it. You may not understand all the specific, but just believe it. Just believe what God says. Amen. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually called what? Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Do you understand? In other words, at the time that this is going to happen, that city spiritually, as far as the spiritual mindset, as far as the spiritual state of that city, it's going to be filthy. It's going to be Sodom. It's going to be Egypt. Yet... It's going to be the holy city. <laughs> he just said in verse, you know, in other words, why the holy? The holy city by virtue of election, by virtue of foreordination. In other words, but actual spiritual climate, the actual spiritual climate. Somebody said, well, I don't understand that, Kurt. Well, you just think back. You, you, you don't understand the righteousness of God. You know, if you really want to understand the righteousness of God, you know where it's revealed in the Scripture? One of the first times, besides Abraham, where the righteousness of God is really revealed, it's revealed in the prophecy of Balaam. Matter of fact, the Scripture, another prophet further on down the line says, hey, you want to understand the righteousness of God, you go back and see what Balaam did. You know, here was Balaam looking out over the children of Israel, and man, they were murmurs, complaining they were filthy. And Almighty God prophet said, he has not found iniquity in Jacob. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. He said, no, this is the righteousness of God. Amen. Not the righteousness, this is right, 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 God, why? Because the righteousness of God is what? Imputed. It's an imputed. That's, that's the only reason God can look on us today. Why? Because that imputed righteousness that covers us. Amen. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And it is imputed unto us. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputed. Righteousness without works. Amen. And that's why the Balaam could look at it. 
And so here's God looking down. It's my holy city, but it's filthy. It's spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented. Listen me careful. They what? Tormented them that dwell on the earth. In other words, these two prophets are going to be the focus point Amen. of the tormenting things that are going to happen on the, of the plagues. Right. Now God has ordained and shown the plagues, but I'm going to tell you, they're going to come at the command here. Right. In, order, in other words, Scripture reveals what some of those plagues are. And, and, I, and I want to show something here in just a minute. And verse 11, And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entereth into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And then the same hour there was a great earthquake. Alrighty. And then the seven trumpet sounds, and the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, let me go on to Revelation chapter number 12. Verse number 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in pain, and pain to be delivered. Now I know I've heard different things, whatever, on this, alrighty? And I'm just going to give it, I want to give it, just listen to me, let me finish it out, alrighty? If you don't believe it, whatever, I'm not, alrighty? But just listen to me, let me give it out, alrighty? Now, then she said, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now I believe in that place right there, that is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. That the child that's going to come forth of that woman is Jesus Christ. Literally, Jesus Christ that came. And I believe literally that dragon was sitting there in the form of the Roman Empire at that time. And Herod gave the decree that they were going to kill all the babies. Why? To seek to devour the child that was born. Now I know people believe that that, that man child come forth as a church. Now whatever. All right? But I believe he's actually talking about when at that time when God people, that woman at that time that had the kingdom of God. And the Bible talks about Jesus Christ come from the seed of David according to the flesh. And the Bible talks about she, he was from Israel as concerning the flesh. As concerning the flesh. And I believe he's talking about that woman at that time, the person who had the promises of God brought forth that child. Alright? And he is caught up. She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. And I believe he's, he's taking an overview. And he's taking us back, and he's going to bring us forward for a while. And he's just going to hit some major points right here. And he does, it's all throughout the scripture. Remember, you've got to understand how God does that sometimes. He'll lay out sometimes a, a, a very detailed explanation, and then all of a sudden, then right after that, he'll give you an overview of, of just a whole picture. Yeah, rerun. That's what it is. He just puts it in fast forward and just lets it fly. And you just, see the, you just see the glimpses of the major events as they go by. You know, and other times he just slows it down, puts it in slow motion, and you just observe carefully in detail. Now, he goes on. Now listen, just, just hear me out for a minute, alrighty? He said, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives, what? Unto the death. Why? Because if they love their lives, they're not going to overcome. But if they're willing to give their lives, and if they're willing to die willingly, they will overcome. Amen. Amen. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell on them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, 
He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now listen to me carefully. I still believe it's Israel. Now watch what happens. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished. She's what? She's nourished. Where's she going to be nourished from? There's two wings of a great eagle that can fly. fly. And she's going to be nourished. Yeah, remember where them olive? They poured forth the oil out of themselves. All right? And they're going to nourish that woman. Listen to me carefully. They're going to nourish her for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Do you know that the Bible says, this, turn with me to Hosea chapter 2. I'm going to read a scripture. You know when the Lord talked to his children of Israel coming out of Egypt, you know what he says? He said, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Let me come. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto my cell. Do you understand what he did when he brought them out of Egypt? God brought them out of Egypt. God fed them. God surrounded them. God would let nobody touch them. And what, what did God do? God pled with them in the wilderness. Yes, yeah. he did. God pled with them in the wilderness. God allured and brought them out into the wilderness. Protect them. Sustain them. Nurse. And pled with them. And pled with them to be his people. And let him be their God. And he brought them out on two eagles. He brought them out on the wings of the prophetic ministry. You know, if you will study back in Egypt, it's amazing how they talk about Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron. About those two as they brought the people out of Egypt. Yes, it does. It is there. And that is the eagle's wing. It was that prophetic. He said, I brought you, I bear you on eagle's wing. He was talking about that prophetic ministry that bore them. And brought them out of Egypt. Now listen to me careful. Why? Because we don't think about it. But what's going to happen in the end time. Is going to be a replay of Egypt. On a bigger scale. And I want to get into that just for a second. It's going to be a replay of Egypt on a bigger scale people. Yes it is. God's going to redeem his people twice. As a matter of fact it's prophesied. In the scripture. Now remember. There's, there is an Egypt. I just read about an Egypt didn't I? Which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Let's be careful. God is going to bring a remnant. There is a remnant there, people. There, there, there's a remnant in Israel of people that are actually crying out for holiness. There is, there is a remnant of Jewish people that, I, I'm talking about they live, God, they live clean lives. They, I, mean, I mean, that land is filled with whoredoms, homosexualities, rebels, and all kinds of wickedness to where, to where spiritually it's called Sodom. But in the, in the midst of all that, there actually is a remnant of people that are crying out for holiness and righteousness. But they just don't know God. But, but their heart is for truth. And, and, God, and, God, and God is going to give them grace. Remember where you was when God gave you grace? Amen. It's going to be the same situation. You were no righteous individual. You are no blessing, you know what I'm saying? But, but there was something in your heart, maybe at the time, that though you need clean, cleansed from your filthiness, but there was a desire to be clean. And so the Lord gave you, and even the desires of God, God gave you the desire to be clean. But there's a remnant in the midst of that. And God's actually going to bring that remnant out of Jerusalem. Let's be careful. I'm going to take them into the wilderness and He is going to feed them for three and a half years. He's going to preserve them. And during that time, He is going to contend with them. He's going to purge out the rebels out of the midst of Jerusalem. He's going to do it, people. Jerusalem's going to go through a fire. It's, the Bible talks about that half the city is going to be taken. The Scripture talks about two-thirds are going to be cut off but there's going to be a third that he's going to bring through the fire. And I'm not going to get those scriptures tonight because there are too many scriptures. I didn't want to get into that part tonight. But there's going to be a third that he's going to bring through the fire. Amen. And he's going to be their God. And they're the ones that he's going to pour out the spirit of grace and supplication upon them. And at the very end, at the coming of Jesus Christ, they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. And they're going to see him. Now, let me go on down. And to Hosea chapter 2. And then I just want... God still loves Jacob. <laughs> Jacob was a rascal in some ways. Is that all right if I use that term? Yeah. 
And yet God still loved Jacob. Look at some of the things you have done. <laughs> if it wasn't for God's grace to us, we'd all be lost. That's the truth. I mean, I'm talking about right today. I, hey, I don't care everything you know by your knowledge, everything you know by your walk today. Hey, Amen. If it were for God's grace today, tomorrow, you, you forget about it. We'd be finished, man. God wouldn't give us a desire in our heart to seek after God. So Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. Hosea 2, 14. He talks about his people. He says, therefore, behold, it's a prophecy. You know, you know what Hosea dealt with? Hosea dealt with a wife that he bought. And yet she went out and committed whoredoms. And then he bought her again. Alrighty. And that's what God's going to do with Israel. God purchased Israel. Amen. And then she went out and committed whoredoms. And at the end, God's going to purchase her again. He's going to purchase her the second time. And it's in Hosea. He said, therefore, behold, I will allure her. And bring her into the wilderness. This is a prophecy of what's going to happen in the end. And speak comfortably unto her. This is that nourishment. And I will give her vineyards from thence. And the valley of Acre for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came out of the land of Egypt. How did she come out of the land of Egypt? By a prophet. She came out of the, and by a prophet. Was Israel preserved? Or what, do you understand what I'm saying? And so them two witnesses are going to take... That's exactly right. They are going to be that covering. They are going to be that eagle's wings. You see, God's going to put back for a period of time onto Israel for three and a half years. He's going to contend with them. And the Spirit's going to leave the church. Amen. That's going to be the night season. The whole world is going to dwell, dwell a night in darkness, it is. And for, and for three and a half years, God is going to plead with His people, Israel, in the midst of the wilderness. He's going to bring them out of Jerusalem and plead with them. And for three and a half years, there's going to be two prophets. And for three and a half years, they're going to do just like in Egypt. Listen to me, they're going to do just like... He talks about, as, it, as I did when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And for three and a half years, all the... And I'm going to get all the kingdom of the world are going to be gathered together. And they're going to war against it. And, and these two prophets are going to bring plague... After plague, yeah. after plague, yeah. after plague, torment and judgment. I I'm telling you what's happened. In other, in other, in other, listen to me carefully. God has ordained that the church challenges the spiritual powers. And the church always does. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against, not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world. Alrighty? And that's the way God made with the church. That's our wrestling. But listen, every time God establishes Israel, and establishes the prophetic ministry in Israel. You know what it's about? It's to separate Israel. Let's be careful. And Israel then always becomes a weapon in the hands of God to challenge the natural governments and powers of this earth. And, and to where today every government on earth is corrupted. It is corrupt. I don't care. There's not a, there's not a righteous government today upon the face of the earth. They are all corrupt. And they're all eventually going to gather together against Israel. And at that time God is going to say, All right. Now, my church has broken the spiritual powers and principalities in the heavenly realm. My church has vanquished them. My church has proven that I am the living and eternal God. That I have dominion over every principality and power in the spiritual realm. My people have overcome death. They've overcome the grave. They've overcome sin. They've overcome iniquity. They've overcome all evil. They've vanquished every principality and power in heavenly places. And the Bible says that by the church might be made known the manifold wisdom of God unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. And then God says, But I still got one last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to take my nation of Israel and I'm going to, just like I threw the church in the face of the spiritual principalities, I'm going to put my nation of Israel in the forefront of every government of this world. And I'm going to put power in my two witnesses and they're going to prophesy 1,206.